والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم للذين ينفقون اموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبه انبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, peace and Allah's mercy be upon you, and welcome to Universal Quran. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam, ala rasulillah. We, we declare that Allah owns all of the right to, his, to any praise and thanksgiving of any creature, that Allah Himself deserves all the praise that we could ever praise for His blessings, and there is no end to the praise which he deserves. Even if we were to spend our entire lifetime, we could never thank him for all of his blessings and bounty upon us. And we pray for his blessings and his peace upon the final prophet, Muhammad. Uh, may Allah's blessing and peace be upon him. The Quran is Allah's universal scripture to mankind. The Quran was revealed to the prophet Muhammad more than 1,400 years ago. But it is not a new message or unique in the sense that it came up with something that had not been taught before. But Allah sent prophets and messengers to every people on this earth. All of the great civilizations, all the tribes and races, had at their foundation a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In each one of those revelations, the same universal teaching was presented, that there is one God who created everybody, and He alone deserves our worship, and we must obey his prophets and messengers. And all those prophets predicted and told their people of future events, that there would be a judgment day and a resurrection in which we would be standing once again before our Lord and be judged based on our lives that we have led here on this earth. So Islam is the universal message of all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the message of the Qur'an is the summation of that message, the last presentation of that, and it is also universal in the sense that it has been given to all of humanity, not to one particular tribe or race or nation, but for everybody until the end of this world. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this message, not only to Muhammad, but to the previous prophets and messengers. Some of them are known and are mentioned in the Holy Quran, and some of them are not known and their names have been forgotten to posterity. One of those prophets was Noah, or Nuh alayhi salam, may peace be upon him. And his story is the focus of chapter 71, the chapter that we are now going to uh, study in today's episode. Chapter 71 is part of the 29th section, the next to last section of the Holy Quran, one of the early chapters revealed in Mecca, concentrating on the message of belief in the oneness of Allah and the necessary of belief in life after death. And so we're going to read this surah uh, about the prophet Noah, or Nuh alayhi salam. Uh, to help us, we have our brother Nuh, who's also named after that prophet, from Ghana. He's going to recite for us the Arabic meaning of these verses, and the English translation of that meaning will be uh, read to us by brother Tahseen from the United States of America. Uh, Noah, if you could please read verses 1 through 9. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahi r-Rahmanir r-Rahim Inna arsalna nuhan ila qawmihi an anthu qawmaka min qabli an yatiyahum azabun alim قال يا قوم إني لكم نذير مبين أن اعبدوا الله واتقوه وأطيعون يغفر لكم من ذنوبكم ويؤخركم إلى أجل مسمى 
إن أجل الله إذا جاء لا يؤخر لو كنتم تعلمون قال رب إني دعوت قومي ليلا ونهارا فلم يزدهم دعائي إلا فرارا وإني كلما دعوتهم لتغفر لهم جعلوا جعلوا أصابعهم في آذانهم واستغشوا ثيابهم واستغشوا ثيابهم وأسروا واستكبروا استكبارا ثم إني دعوتهم جهارا ثم إني أعلنت لهم وأسررت لهم إسرارا. Thank you. I seek refuge with Allah from Shaitan, the outcast. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Verily, we sent Nuh to his people, saying, "Warn your people before there comes to them a painful torment." He said, "O my people." Verily, I am a plain warner to you, that you should worship Allah, be dutiful to Him, and obey Me. He will forgive you of your sins and respite you in an appointed term. Verily, the term of Allah, when it comes, cannot be delayed. If you but knew, He said, "O my Lord, verily I have called my people night and day, but all of my calling added nothing but to flight." And verily, every time I called unto them, that you might forgive them, they thrust their fingers into their ears, covered themselves up with their garments, and persisted in their refusal, and magnified themselves in pride. Then verily, I called to them openly. Then verily, I proclaimed to them in public, and I have appealed to them in private. Thank you. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. And all the people to whom this message comes after him, uh, that he sent Noah as one of his messengers and prophets to his people. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent to each group of people a messenger and prophet. And so Noah was called by Allah to warn his people before the coming of a painful, terrible chastisement befalls them. Uh, this, of course, is referring to the flood of Noah. That Uh, they, they were uh, evil people, wicked people who were not worshiping Allah, who were worshiping others besides Allah, worshiping idols, and so Allah decreed a punishment. But if they responded to Noah's message and and sought repentance, Allah would forgive them and would not punish them with the great flood. Yes. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, was the flood in one particular area or the whole world in general? Well. First of all, we have to realize that Allah sent each prophet to a particular people. So Noah was sent to his particular people, but that those were the children of Adam, and it was a few generations after Adam, and so there was a limited number of human beings, and they lived in a certain particular part of the world. So it's not necessary that the flood covered the entire world, but it could be, as of course the Arabic word al-ard could mean the whole world. Or it could mean only the land where those people lived, which is the land called Mesopotamia, what is now Iraq, in the middle of the world, where the original civilizations uh, uh, were born. But in either case, whether it was the whole world or just that one part, it was to punish the people who heard the message. So all the people who were punished were those who heard the message of Noah and rejected him. Now. If you go to Mesopotamia, their ancient legends, which were recorded by them, remember this flood. And in fact, archaeologists have discovered the fact and that there were layers and layers of cities built on top of each other, and then a layer of silt that covered all the cities in the whole land. They were all flooded at one time. So that is a proof that this actually did happen. And in fact, the people of every nation in the world, in the natives to America, the natives in In Africa and Asia and Europe, all of them had ancient legends reminding them of a flood that came and destroyed all of the people of the world. And so people still remember this this flood 
but they may have changed some of the details. Details got changed and forgotten or added to over the retelling of this tale. But in any case, Allah sent Noah to warn his people. His people rejected the message, except for a few who entered the ark or the boat with him and were saved from the flood. And then the waters receded and the boat landed on Mount Judy, which is near in the Ararat range on the Turkish border, just uh, north of what is now the country of Iraq, because they rejected this message of Allah SWT. But Allah is not just telling us this message as a history lesson. And in fact, it's mentioned in several places, different details of the story of Noah are mentioned in different places. But he's bringing this message as a particular example of a prophet who went to his people, and if his people rejected, then they would be rejected by Allah and punished as a warning to the people of Arabia who were hearing the message of the Prophet Muhammad. If they also rejected, then the same punishment would befall them that punish that befell other people who came before them. They would be wiped out by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they rejected their Prophet. Uh, the further verses that you just recited um, show us the message of Noah to his people. And this is something that's not found in other scriptures. It gives us the idea of the flood and that Noah was a prophet, but it doesn't tell us what he said to his people. And this is being told us here to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to all of us as how to give da'wah or to teach the message of Islam to people. So first in verse 2, he said that he told his people, I'm here as a clear warning. I am not... Uh, a God myself, I'm not a divine being, I'm a human being who's been entrusted with a message. There's good news, which is if you will repent, Allah will forgive you of your idolatry and your sinful behavior. And the bad news is if you reject, then destruction is going to come to you here on this earth. And even if you were to escape from destruction on this earth, then there's destruction uh, for you eternally in hellfire. But they wouldn't listen. And in fact, he said that... Uh, even though he called upon them night and day, continually calling upon them, yet his da'wah, his message, would not increase them anything except in escaping from the message, falling farther and farther into error. They did not want to be forgiven of their sins. He said, I have called my people night and day, secretly and openly. Uh, but In verse 6, But my call added nothing to them but their flight away from the truth. And when I call them, they plug their ears with their fingers. They place their fingers within their ears so they won't have to listen to the message. Or they cover up their faces in their heads. They, put their, they pull their jacket or their coat over their faces so that Noah won't recognize them. So Noah is, rec is preaching, te teaching people, and they don't want him to see them and recognize them and call them. So they hide their identity so they can escape and run away as fast as they can. They don't want to be reminded of the message. And so he tried different approaches because sometimes they didn't want to hear in public. He would go to them in private so they won't be embarrassed and talk to them privately, just between me and you. Sometimes people are afraid of harm coming to them. If they become a Muslim, they may be harmed by people or threatened. And so they may embrace Islam secretly in private, but not, not tell people about their religion. And that's acceptable if they're in danger, that you could make da'wah to them in private. And then when they feel safe, and comfortable, then they can openly proclaim their adherence to the religion of Islam. So even to this day, throughout the world, there are people who are secretly following the religion of Islam because they're afraid of people killing them or persecuting them or depriving them of their, their way of life or their living. And so if it's not possible for them to practice Islam uh, publicly, they can practice it secretly. And then if it's not even possible for them to do that, they can try to uh, migrate to some... Muslim society where they would be free to practice their religion. We'll go to a break now and then we'll be back to read more of chapter 71, the story of Noah. <laughs> The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the Most High spoke the Qur'an. It's the thing between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are we given the rights of the Qur'an? Are we ready to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day of judgment? For the Qur'an to take us from our hands to the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we go through every verse in the Qur'an to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? 
Watch Huda TV, Quran in depth. Welcome back to Universal Quran. We're reading from chapter 71, the story of Noah, Nuh alayhi salam. And just to remind us, Noah was sent to his people, the descendants of Adam, to teach them to worship Allah alone, not to worship any other gods or false deities besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to obey Noah. And if they obeyed him, uh, they would, the punishment would be diverted away from them. But they were stubborn and persisted. Noah spent 950 years calling mankind to this message. So, the longest living of these prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet Muhammad himself spent 23 years calling his people. And in 23 years, uh, by Allah's grace, he was successful. And he changed them totally from the most backward barbaric people to the most advanced, uh, pious, knowledgeable people who founded a civilization. And what we are getting today is simply the fruits of their labors that by Allah's grace they were able to preserve this message and pass it along to us 1,000 years later and more. And so the Prophet ﷺ was successful. But Noah worked 950 years. Not because he didn't work hard. He worked very hard, but his people were extremely arrogant. And so he used every method of da'wah, of calling people and inviting them. He invited them in public and in private. He made public preaching, taught people by his example. Even his own family sometimes rejected him. Even his wife was committing adultery without his knowledge and was drowned. One of his sons also was not among his true followers and refused and the wife and the son said, no, we, we're not afraid of the flood. We'll go to the high ground and inshallah we'll be saved by going to high ground. But even the highest ground in their land was covered over in the flood and they were drowned. This shows us a lesson that the Arabs understood and that we should understand. It doesn't matter who, who your father is or your husband. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're related to a prophet, if you're a descendant of the prophet, if you're a member of the highest uh, tribe, the descendants of Abraham. It doesn't matter what your race or nationality is. None of that will do any good. But if you reject Allah and you do not obey the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, you will be uh, in hellfire along with uh, everybody else who has rejected this message. So the Prophet wasallam went to his own beloved daughter, Fatima, and said, Fatima, you have to save yourself. I, your father, can't save you, but you have to save yourself by turning to Allah. And of course, she was one of the first believers who believed in the message of her father. But other relatives of the Prophet ﷺ, his own uncle, rejected this message and they're in hellfire. So it doesn't do you any good to be a Sharif or of noble birth, of descent of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, or descent of Abraham, but on the Day of Judgment, you will stand accountable for your own actions. And so Ibn Kathir, one of the great scholars of the Tafsir, said that see these examples of how the Prophet Noah was using every method of da'wah so that he would be most successful. If you only use one method in calling people and presenting the message, it will only be effective to some people. But if you use all the different methods available, it will be most successful. So here we're using the, 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 the media of, of television. One of the medium, the medium of television is one of the media of reaching people today. And there are many other ways of preaching, teaching, writing, speaking to people in public, speaking to them in private. Every way that you can to relate the message to their own lives. Uh, let's read the next verses 10 through 14, please. Fakul to stop firu rabbakum in a who can a go fair or your sale is some a alaykum midder or wayum did a kumbi am لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا مَا لَكُمْ لَا تَرْجُونَ لِلَّهِ وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ أَطْوَارًا Thank you. 
I said to them, Ask forgiveness from your Lord. Verily, he is off forgiving. He will send rain to you in abundance and give you increase in wealth and children and bestow on you gardens and bestow on you rivers. What is the matter with you? You hope not for the reward from Allah while he has created you in stages? So this is one of the examples of the da'wah or calling to people and inviting them in many different ways. And this is found in the, throughout the Qur'an that Allah gives us the negative example and the positive. He warns people about hellfire and punishment and he warns them about paradise and success. So in verse 10, it's a positive thing, showing Allah's grace and mercy. Ask forgiveness of Allah, He is the all-forgiving. He will forgive your sins. He's compassionate and cares for humanity. He's your true Lord who has raised you as a farmer raises a crop and cares for it or a parent raises a child. Allah SWT cares for people more than the parent, mother, or father cares for their own offspring. And Allah SWT has given you great blessings. No matter how great your sins, even as the Prophet ﷺ said, even if your sins are as much as the sands in number, or the sea in quantity, that Allah, even if you're, you have a world full of sins, Allah, if you will repent to Him, will bring you a world full of forgiveness. He will forgive all of your sins. So, if the negative approach doesn't work, you try the positive approach and show them Allah's caring and compassion for them, His love for humanity. And then He promises them something in the next verse from 11 through 13. That if you will uh, repent to Allah and submit yourself, you will get rain in abundance and you will get great blessings from Allah in this world. It's not only a promise of success in the hereafter, but you will also see if you have a strong faith or iman in your heart, a sincerity in obeying Allah's laws, that there is a natural law of cause and effect, that if you do good sincerely, you will receive a good reward in this life as well as the hereafter. So he said, you will receive rain in abundance. And for this reason, Omar ibn Khattab, the second khalifa or successor of the Prophet wasallam, in istisqa, when the Muslims were in drought and they needed water, they needed rain, he went on the minbar and he read this chapter, he read this verse. That's what he did in order to ask for rain in abundance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he will increase your wealth and children, bestow upon you beautiful gardens, bestow upon you rivers. That our rizq or our abundance that we receive from Allah, our provision can be increased by obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we're in a time of difficulty and we're not receiving what we not need, or if our land, our, our country is having droughts and the rivers are dried up and the wills are dried up and the crops are not productive, that it's because we need to repent of our sins and return to Allah and Allah has promised to give us reward in this world as well as in the hereafter. And if, in that case, our reward is postponed and our prayer is not answered and we do not receive that abundance, either because we are still committing sins or people in our land are committing sins openly and we are not preventing them and, and asking them to cease their evil behavior, or it's because Allah wants to store up even more reward for us in the hereafter by having us be patient in this life. So we find, for example, that in this world, it's the sunnah of Allah or Allah's custom in treating us that sometimes we have success and sometimes failure. In the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, there was a failure where people in Makkah didn't initially embrace Islam, but later on there was success. There was the Battle of Badr, which was successful. Then after it was Uhud, which was not successful. So we have to endure sometimes success and sometimes uh, a lack of success or failure. But if we will be patient, it's an act of worship, which will raise us up in the hereafter. So what is wrong with you that you do not hope for reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is showing us Allah's greatness or waqar, the greatness of Allah, His, His divine attributes of perfection. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to give us everything that we dream of and things that we don't even dream of. It's part of His munificence and generosity to mankind. We have to acknowledge that we are totally dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is totally independent of us. He doesn't need anything from us or anything from this entire world, but we need everything from Him. Then we have to realize He's compassionate. He has given us great, beautiful gardens and, and bestowed upon us our abundance. 
and he is also just. <coughs> if we misuse what has been given to us of our wealth and blessings from Allah, then we will have to stand before him in judgment in this life by having it taken away from us or in the hereafter in hellfire. Uh, and the last verse you read, and he has created us in stages. That our creation, we weren't born on this earth, we could have been created as adults. As Adam, the first human being, was created from clay, as an adult, as a completely formed human being. But all of us, the children of Adam, were created in stages. That first we were that insignificant fluid that was dis discharged from our father's loins and it deposited in the womb of our mother. And then Allah took that and developed it in a most marvelous way. And this knowledge was not known to Western science until maybe a hundred years ago, to the latter part of the 19th century. But they believed that in the womb, human beings were just very tiny, fully formed human beings, and they just grew bigger and bigger and bigger. That was what science told people. But the Quran told us, no, in many different verses, that human beings were created from stages. First, the alaqa, which clings, the nutfa, or that discharge. Then the alaqa, the clinging, leech-like thing, which clings to the side. And then it developed into the mudra, the, that looked like a chewed piece of flesh as the skeletal structure, the bones and the spinal cord are visible, almost looking like teeth marks on the developing child. And then it develops all of its limbs and its mind and its heart starts beating and its brain starts forming and developing. So we were created from something insignificant. And that insignificant thing was gradually developed. Each stage was totally in the hands of Allah. At any stage, if the development goes wrong, the child would miscarry, it would be aborted, and it would, it would die. But by Allah's grace, we were fully developed and we have our minds and our senses and we're able to hear the message. And it's all by Allah's creation. None of us created himself or herself. And none of us had any power whatsoever or influence over our creation. And which of us even remember our creation? Not one of us remembers being in the womb of our mother or going through those stages. So it's a sign that how can we be arrogant? How can we not humble ourselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But we aren't our own creators. And yet now we think, now that we have been born, and when we were born, we were totally helpless. We had a nurse. We had to be cared for. We had everything cared for for many years as children. We had to be taught and educated, and we had to learn language and learn how to support ourselves. There are some animals in the creation that are born and they stand up on their own feet and go find their, their food and take care of themselves after that. Or after a short time, they're born and they're blind and they're helpless and then they, with a short time their eyes open and they're independent. They don't need their parents anymore. But we took years and years of being dependent on others. And yet Allah provided those people to care for us and to nurture us and to educate us to the stage which we're at. And yet we're arrogant and reject our Creator. Shame on us for being like that. But we should be humble and submit ourselves to Allah's revelation. And of course, that is the meaning of Islam, to submit ourselves. Uh, this is a, a beautiful surah. May Allah guide us to humbly submitting ourselves as true Muslim men and women to the universal Quran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وترى الجبال تحسبها جامدة وهي تمر مر السحاب صنع الله الذي أتقن كل شيء إنه خبير بما تفعلون مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل وكل في فلك يسبحون